Okay, our first lecture this afternoon is going to be given by Dr. Guido Holzman. Uh, Guido is a professor of economics at the University of Angers in France, the, uh, the author of uh, The Last Night of Liberalism. And his lecture this afternoon is on the division of labor and social change. Guido? What I will do in my lecture is uh, to uh, introduce uh, two concepts that are fundamental to uh, understand uh, one of the, the basic questions of uh, economic analysis and of economic policy also, which is the question of economic growth. What are the causes of economic growth? Uh, the, the famous debate, uh, the famous revolution in uh, economic thinking initiated by uh, Adam Smith, at the end of the end of the 18th century, it was a revolt against the prevailing doctrine at the time that uh, the spending of money, in particular the spending of money on consumer goods, constituted the origin and the main driving uh, engine of uh, uh, wealth and of economic progress. So Adam Smith rejected the prevailing doctrine at the time, which is. Uh, uh, you might guess also, again, the prevailing do doctrine of our time today, namely that in order to promote economic growth and that even to keep the economy going, you have to spend a lot of money and prevent at any rate that spending ever declines. So Adam Smith rejected this and uh, proposed a completely different vision of the true causes of economic growth. And the true causes of economic growth, according to Adam Smith, were the division of labor and parsimony or in other words, savings. So our lecture today uh, deals with uh, these two concepts, the division of labor and savings, because Austrian economics, which appeared about 100 years after Adam Smith, did not push beside uh, these concepts, and this conception of uh, the true causes of the wealth of nations, but developed them. And what, Austrian, what the Austrian economists did was not to substitute a completely new way of thinking at the place of classical economists. Rather, it took, it, it carried on the revolution initiated by Adam Smith and enriched his body of thinking by eliminating uh, certain errors uh, that, that went ahead with the, the, the valid notions that Adam Smith had introduced, in particular as far as value theory is, is concerned and price theory is concerned. So you heard already uh, one or two lectures this morning on these subjects. So we're now turning to the valid core of classical economists, or classical eco economics, which was then carried on by Austrian economists. So let's start with uh, a few definitions. The first definition is production. Production is the conscious transformation of nature. Production is, is uh, the, the origin, of course, of economic uh, growth and of the wealth uh, from which we, we benefit. Right? Because there, if uh, human beings, uh, just to be happy with the things that they found spontaneously in nature, with the apples that grow spontaneously there, and the, the honey that the bees spontaneously uh, uh, produce in, their, uh, in their, their trees and so on, we wouldn't get very far. So the way to greater wealth, to well-being, to material well-being, is through production. Production is therefore in the conscious transformation of, of nature. Conscious transformation, that is, there's always an element of choice uh, involved. Right? There's always human choice. And there's always the notion of subjective value. Because, of course, we try not to transform nature in, in a random manner, but in a way uh, such that the new state of affairs that results as a consequence of our choice, as a consequence of our intervention, uh, is preferred. <coughs> to the state of nature that would have preferred, would have prevailed if we had done nothing. Okay? So production is always steered by subjective value and always results from human choice. The second um, concept that we need to introduce is labor. Labor is uh, so production through human action. Not all production processes involve human action constantly. There's always some human action involved, but not constantly. Think, for example, uh, of uh, wine production, so at the, uh, at the harvest time and so on, you uh, uh, harvest the, the grapes, and then you transform them through various uh, uh, 
techniques and so on, you finally bottle the wine in, in wine bottles, and then you store them for a while, or sometimes also in barrels. Right? You keep them in barrels for what, what, about eight months, nine months, or sometimes even longer than this, three years, and uh, eventually you, you bottle them. And then also you keep the bottles on store because the wine is one of those things that get better with the time. As uh, economists also, they sometimes tend to get better with time because errors are eradicated. So in this case, then, the production process itself right, is, is, is being carried on, but there's no more human uh, labor involved. Right? But there is human labor at the beginning, right? and there is constant, uh, constant decision-making. So it's, it's a conscious transformation of nature because, of course, the owner of the wine bottles could interrupt this maturing process at any point of time. Right? He could go then, for example, sell the bottle or throw a party and then drink the bottles and so on. Right? So it's always a choice to continue this production process. So in the case of labor, the production process is carried on through human action. And of course, uh, we uh, need to make uh, here uh, two remarks. One is that uh, we need not to confuse this general concept of labor with um, a more narrow concept that we very find often, very often in economic analysis, which, by which we mean then uh, paid assistance. Right? If we hire somebody to uh, uh, do manual work for us, but also intellectual work, and then uh, it's a different notion of labor. It's also labor involved, but it's a more narrow notion. Right? It's a paid assistant. You hire a CEO for your company, he is a paid assistant. He's providing labor, labor services. Okay? But here what we are doing now in our lecture is to understand labor in a larger sense right? so that also the entrepreneur, um, who is not a paid assistant of himself, he's not a paid assistant of the, uh, of the consumers, he is a, he's an independent producer. He's providing labor services to, uh, to consumers and to his customers, right? but not in this narrow sense of a paid assistant. And then, of course, we keep in mind that production, as I've already said, always involves at least some labor. Third, the third revision is uh, the definition then is the uh, division of labor. And you can read it here. So, division of labor occurs when several persons associate in such a way uh, that each one of them specializes in one type of activity, and each associate then produces economic goods in excess of his personal needs. And sometimes he produces something, he or she produces something that he or she doesn't need at all. Right? For example, uh, if you're engaged in the production, let's say, of these uh, uh, remote controls, you might not have a personal need for them at all, and still you're producing them. So all of your production is excess, in excess of your personal needs. And this, of course, then in order to share or exchange, right? Exchange, of course, in a market economy, that's the main phenomenon that we are interested in, but it can also be shared, given as a gift, and so on, right? With the other associates, for example, with family members, right? I don't sell my services to my wife, but it's not yet, and... Uh, <laughs> But still, we are engaging in the division of labor. Right? Uh, so we share our excess production when I mow the lawn and so on. I do the dishwashing and so on. I do also wash her dish, right? So the, we get along. Okay, so why does this... Uh, oh, 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 wait a minute. I need to go back because I have two remarks here. The division of labor can result from one plan for all associates. So this is, uh, in particular, the case of central planning. Right? Uh, on an aggregate point, uh, point of view, on the national uh, point of view. And it can also result from the mutual uh, adjustment of individual plans. And this is the main phenomenon of the market economy. This is actually the, uh, the, the type of the division of labor that we are mainly interested in. But I will not deal with this in detail in my lecture. I will just lead you up to this point. And then my successors will develop this point in more detail. Okay, so here's our lecture outline then. We'll first talk about the benefits of the division of labor by considering a few numerical examples and uh, then turn to the main cause of the division of labor, which is uh, savings. Okay. Uh, I already mentioned that Adam Smith identified savings and the division of labor as the two main causes of economic growth. And his name is in particular associated with the division of labor. So if you ask any student that had, heard, uh, had virtually any economics instruction at all, or maybe just read one or two articles on the history of economic thought, you would associate the name of Adam Smith with the theory of the division of labor. 
And in fact, there is one very famous chapter in the, the first book of Adam Smith's uh, book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, which deals with the division of labor and which has this title, The Division of Labor. What is less uh, uh, well known, but which you should know and which you sh should remember, is that Adam Smith uh, accords a much greater attention to parsimony and to savings. So he has one chapter in the first book on the division of labor. He devotes an entire book, so the, uh, the five uh, parts of uh, the wealth of nations are called books, right? For book one, two, five. The second book is entirely devoted to the analysis of the impact of savings. Right? It's a book on stocks, plain saving at the time. So already from the point of view of Adam Smith, savings were really the driving engine of the market economy and of economic progress. And it is, as I will show to you, indeed the main cause of an increase of the division of labor. And if we want to increase the division of labor, if we want to uh, uh, increase the benefits that result therefrom, we have to in uh, increase savings. And then finally, I'll conclude with uh, some observations on the problem of coordination, that is the problem of how we concretely organize the division of labor. Okay, so we start with the benefits of the division of labor. And consider the first case, the case of absolute advantages. So I'll take your point of view. So uh, you see I have uh, uh, three lines actually, settings here. So we have here a, a set of numbers that reflect uh, the situation, the in initial situation before the division of labor occurs. And then do two sets of uh, numbers that reflect the situation after the division of labor occurs. So we have here two associates, Peter and Paul, right? and they have a physical productivity in terms of the production of two goods, rabbits, R, and plums, P. Right? So it's P, plums, R, rabbits. I'll keep in mind, again, I underline here physical productivity, because in economic analysis we also dist distinguish monetary productivity, uh, profitability, and so on as, as a type of uh, productivity. Uh, so we always need to carefully distinguish these different notions of productivity. Often uh, in economic analysis, a very widespread uh, source of, of error that people uh, smoothly shift from one meaning of productivity or another, they start off talking about physical productivity and then they get to profitability and so on. It's not the same thing. Uh, so we need to keep this apart. So Peter can, as we see here, he can produce two rabbits per hour. That is what does it mean he can produce two rabbits per hour. He can hunt down two rabbits per hour. Hunt down and then, well, whatever, kill them or put them in a cage. Right? He can leave this open. However his, however his wife likes them, or, or however Peter Paul likes them, right? And he plucks 500 uh, plums per hour. So he leads an existence as a hunter-gatherer. And <laughs> Paul is also a hunter-gatherer, right? So they, they have exactly the same preferences for consumption. So Paul also eats rabbits, and he eats plums. And he's uh, therefore also engaged in rabbit hunting. But you see, he is less productive than Peter in hunting. He only hunts down one rabbit per hour. But on the other hand, he is more productive uh, in plum picking. So we have here a case of absolute advantages. Right? Peter is absolutely the better rabbit producer, and Paul is absolutely the better plum producer. So. Uh, Maybe there was a situation bef uh, before the real engagement in the division of labor in which each of them devoted uh, two times five hours to the production of each of these uh, uh, goods. So Peter spent 10 hours on, um, excuse me, five hours on hunting rabbits. So five hours times two rabbits equals 10 rabbits. And Paul spends five hours on uh, hunting, he uh, hunts down five rabbits. And in another five hours, Peter picks 2,500 plums and Paul 5,000 plums. So we have an aggregate production of 15 rabbits and 7,500 7, plums before the division of labor. 
Now the two of, of them engage in a division of labor. And we can leave it out uh, here, oh, the reasons for which they stumble upon the fact that it might be useful to, uh, to develop a, a division of labor. Right? Maybe um, they come to talk to one another or they observe one another and so on. So one of them might init initiate the process and they finally agree uh, to uh, divide labor amongst them. Peter says, okay, I will just go hunting. I will uh, no longer spend five hours, but 10 hours on hunting, and Paul will do the same thing for uh, plum pluck, uh, picking. And as a consequence, then Peter hunts down 20 rabbits, and Paul 10,000 uh, plucks uh, 10,000 plum, plums. So as a consequence, then, uh, our aggregate product is uh, 20 rabbits and 10,000 plums. And this is, of course, the crucial figure which we can con uh, compare with these figures here. So we see that there are more rabbits hunted down and more plums picked, which is the crucial thing. So the division of labor is, as we say, physically productive. The division of labor is a cause of additional wealth which would not exist in the absence of the division of labor. Okay? So the division of labor is a true cause of the wealth of this little community and eventually also of a true cause of the wealth of a nation. Right? There's more around. We don't go into analyzing the mechanisms according to which they can divide this additional product, right? So there is uh, five additional rabbits available and 2,500 plums that are available on top. They might div divide this according to any contract that they set up that is mutually agreeable for both of them, right? Or find some other, for example, they might throw dices or uh, ask uh, whatever their favorite uh, girlfriend or something, and she will divide it amongst them. Various things are imaginable. Okay. And you see here, so I added uh, another line, another line of circumstances to take account of the following fact. Thanks to the division of labor, thanks to the specialization involved in uh, pursuing uh, certain activities exclusively, the producers get more, become more productive. So the physical productivity that we defined here initially is not a, a natural constant. It is some, it's a dependent variable that depends on the amount of uh, time that we invest in acquiring knowledge and dexterity relative to this activity. And of course, as they now engage in the division of labor, Peter thereby will become even more efficient as a hunter and less efficient as a plum picker. Right, so you see here, he now, after a while, is able to hunt down three rabbits per hour. Right, so his productivity in hunting increases, and his productivity in plum picking diminishes, right, because he loses the habitude to do this. And the inverse uh, thing holds true for Paul. So Paul eventually is not able to hunt down a single uh, rabbit per hour, so whereas his plum picking ability increases. And the consequence is that, this, that eventually... Once the new productivity plays out, the, the total, the aggregate product, will further increase. Right? So the division of labor is therefore beneficial, is a true cause of, of wealth on two accounts. In the short run, or we might say immediately, by the simple fact of exploiting differences in the productivity. And then second, because it reinforces uh, the initial differences between the producers that existed, and that gave occasion to this division of labor. Okay, now let's consider a more difficult case, but also a more interesting case. This is the case of relative adva uh, comparative advantages. Also called the, cause, uh, the, the case of the superman, the super producer. Right? Before each of uh, the producers, each of the associates had one field in which he was superior to the other. In the case of comparative advantages, one producer is superior to the other guy in all respects. He is the superman, the other guy is the, whatever, the low life or so. One is the parent, the other is the child. One is the German, the other is the, Fr the French. This doesn't hold true in, 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 in government negotiations, right? When Mr. Sarkozy meets uh, Madame Berkel, it's, it's, it's not the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not the same thing. 
Okay, so he, we, we see here that Paul is the Superman, right? Also, uh, to my uh, students in France, I always say, uh, one is China, and the other is France, right? So it's ah, this huge guy, and this, this can, can do everything that we cannot do, and on all the things that we can do, they can do much better, and so that will smash all of us. How can we possibly resist this monster? Right? So Paul here is this monster with seven heads and ten arms. And Peter, or Pierre, is the small French guy. Right? <laughs> and so he's less efficient everywhere. His uh, physical productivity is lower. So before the division of labor, well, so, uh, that was the aggregate uh, output. And now comes the following. And uh, uh, the, the insight that the division of labor between the two is possible is an insight that came with the classical economists, not with Adam Smith, but with an English economist by the name of David Ricardo. Most of you have probably heard his name, and those who, of you who study economics, of course, you know the theory of comparative advantage. Right? But it was truly an enormous breakthrough. Because before Ricardo, nobody sensed how such a division of labor might be possible. There were very strong political implications. Right? If one guy was a superman, right? Government of a prince, typically, right? It's much stronger, much stronger household than everybody else. I mean, what could the others typically give to him? How could they possibly recompense his services? Right? Well, it was not really any economic thing that they could give him because he could do everything better. Well, okay, then graciously he delivered his protection services anyway. And in exchange, he asked for obedience. Okay? It's a very common kind of deal proposed by governments that we also find in our time. Right? And Ricardo completely overthrew the conception that economists and also wider population henceforth had of the relationship between superiors and inferiors. Because Ricardo demonstrated that both parties still have an interest in cooperation, in a division of labor, in mutual association. It's not only the weaker party that benefits, it's also the stronger party that derives material benefits from such a division of labor. So that's what we see here. Right? In, the, in the first case, uh, a division of labor in such a case can typically arrange in the fact that uh, the weaker part entirely specializes on that activity where he is relatively better. That is, he's, he's still absolutely worse, but he's not quite as bad uh, in, in hunting as he is in plum picking. So we see in, in plum picking, Paul is four times as productive as Peter but in hunting only two times as productive. So Peter then will spend all of his time there where he has a comparative advantage, where he's not quite as bad right, as, as elsewhere. And so he hunts 10 hours and he produces 20 rabbits. No plum picking. And Paul, he subdivides his time. Otherwise, before it was two times five hours. So now he can reduce his hunting time. Right? He goes to four hours. Uh, excuse me, he goes, to, um, uh, he goes to three hours right, and spends seven hours on plum picking. Right? Seven hours times 2,000 gives us 14,000, and three hours times uh, four rabbits gives us 12 rabbits. So these are the new uh, production figures, and we see that the aggregate product is, again, larger than the previous aggregate product. So that's the demonstration. There's no other demonstration. Right? I can do the same thing with equations and so on, but it's the same result. Right? The, the aggregate product is higher as a consequence of the division of labor. So again, also in the case of one completely superior producer, the division of labor produces aggregate benefits for all associates, for all parties concerned. And these aggregate benefits are reinforced through the same mechanisms that we mentioned already before, right? Through the division of labor, the differences uh, uh, increase, or in this case here, Peter loses some of his competitive uh, disadvantage, right? So he, he, his productivity in hunting increases. He's still inferior to Paul. Paul can hunt down four rabbits per hour, uh, but Peter, uh, Peter only three, but his productivity has increased from two to three. And Paul becomes a more, even more efficient producer of uh, plums before he picked 2,000, now 2,500 plums per hour. Okay, last case that we have to consider 
is the case in which there are no natural differences. Right? A natural equality between the associates. So we have here a case in which Peter and Paul are, so to say, clones. Right? Maybe one eye, one, one egg, uh, twins or something like this. How, how you call this? Uh, it's not one egg. Identical twins, yeah, coming out of one egg, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so they're really clones. Maybe the result of some preceding government intervention. <laughs> Darth Vader coming to the country, right, he's cloning his army and so on, so, right? If Peter and Paul, I mean, why give names to clones and so on? Well, it was a fancy of his wife and so on, so he... <laughs> Named this clone Peter and the other Paul, and one got a whatever black mark and the other red one, so you could distinguish them. And they were completely equal at the beginning, right? So, and then we see that if they engage in the division of labor, then actually the aggregate uh, production does not increase. Right? So, the division of labor, at least in the short run, in the immediate run, does not produce, is not wealth producing. From which we can derive a very important conclusion, namely that. The division of labor is worthwhile only if there are differences between the associates. If they're perfectly equal, there cannot be a div beneficial division of labor. It's impossible. Fortunately, in this case, such differences developed, and they developed thanks to specialization. Right? So Peter, who is now engaged in, in hunting, he becomes a better hunter because he specializes in this activity. And, uh, and Paul, who specializes in uh, the production of plums becomes a more efficient picker of plums. And so eventually, their division of labor will become worthwhile. And it becomes worthwhile only precisely because the division of labor reinforces natural differences or creates differences where no natural differences existed. Right? So again, the result is, is validated. Right? Uh, the division of labor produces beneficial outcomes for different human beings, not for clones. Okay, so let's summarize these uh, results in two steps, so the benefits of the division of labor. The division of labor entails material advantages for all associates. Right? Because it uh, helps to exploit uh, differences in physical productivity through specialization. And uh, this entails a higher aggregate physical production, as we have seen. Right? So there are more consumer goods to be produced, uh, more leisure and more capital accumulation. Uh, so this point we have not demonstrated. We have seen there are more consumer goods. Right? But of course, this, this is an uh, inference here. Right? Uh, the division of labor tends to produce more leisure because rather than producing more plums and more rabbits, Peter and Paul could also have decided to reduce their work time. Right? Before they were working 10 hours a day, now they could produce the same amount as before, maybe in nine hours. So they gain an extra hour that they can spend sitting on the, on the grass, singing with the birds and so on. Right? Uh, so they have more leisure, right? uh, only because the, the uh, physical productivity has increased. It's also possible to increase in greater capital accumulation. That's the point that we will see in a, in a few minutes in more detail. Right? If they have created a greater amount of consumer goods, they can engage uh, in capital accumulation. And again, we have to keep in mind that we are reasoning now in terms of physical uh, production we need to distinguish this from the value of the physical product and from the monetary revenue that is associated with it. Right? In my lecture, we are focusing entirely on point A. Right? And point B is taken as, as a given because um, uh, we're we considering, considering only cases in which uh, people engage in the division of labor that they consider to be worthwhile. Right? The division of labor is more physically productive in all cases. For example, we could organize... Uh, with all people in this lecture, we could organize the production of uh, paper planes. Okay? We have a lot of people here sitting here, 100, 100 people and so, so we can subdivide the different steps of plane production. We can produce very complicated planes that have certain flying uh, abilities and so on, right? So by engaging in a division of labor, we can produce more and better planes than 
we could, if we, each of them produce or spend our time on the uh, production on uh, paper planes on ourselves. Okay. The other question is, is this worthwhile? Why don't we sit here and produce paper planes, but rather sit here and go through a lecture on the division of labor <laughs> and social order? Well, because we consider this to be more important. So it's not because things are physically, certain activities are more physically productive than others that we choose to pursue them. Right? The division of labor is always produces always a higher physical outcome. It does not mean that we engage in it. Right? it must, we must value the outcome. The outcome must be more important than what we would have done otherwise. Okay, so we need to distinguish uh, these two things. And uh, in a market economy, uh, the question of value is intermediated through monetary revenue, right? As we have, as we will see in some more detail, in a market economy, the subjective values of consumers translate into monetary revenue for companies. And therefore, companies tend to produce those things that are most valuable for consumers. Right? Companies do not produce paper planes, but other things that consumers actually cherish. Okay. Second point, uh, specialization, as we have seen, reinforces natural differences and creates man-made, that is, cultural differences between the associates. And this results uh, from uh, the increased dexterity and uh, we develop specialized uh, knowledge. So there is not only a, a division, the division of labor not only involves a division of the of activities, of, of uh, gestures and so on, uh, uh, things that we do with our body and so on, but also the kind of knowledge that we acquire. So there is a division of knowledge in society. We have here then a virtuous circle, right? or potentially a virtuous circle. Right? That the more we engage in the division of labor, the differences are reinforced. Because we are more different than before, we become, the division of labor becomes even more worthwhile, so there's a stronger incentive to engage in the division of labor, and so on and so on. Okay, and the last point then, uh, this first step, the division of labor is the origin uh, of society. This is a point that has long been uh, recognized, that is from the uh, uh, philosophers of ancient Greece. Right? Um, for those of you uh, who are not philosophers, I still recommend that you take a look at least at the opening chapters of Plato's uh, Republic, where he goes through these considerations, right? Plato engage, uh, wants to define uh, the best possible uh, form of social organization, which he calls the republic. In German, it's the state, the best possible state. And he starts off by analyzing the, the reasons for which people associate in the first place. And he underlines, well, people associate in the first place because they derive material benefits from it. This might not be the only reason for societies to form, but it's actually a very powerful reason. Why is it very powerful? Because it does not require that we feel natural sympathy to our neighbors or to our uh, uh, family members and so on. Right? We might be indifferent uh, toward our neighbor. We might actually hate him because he is whatever, blonde or uh, has a crooked uh, eye or something like this, right? so a, has bad jokes, right? so we, we, we hate him. But not cooperating with him would deprive us of uh, goods and services that we would otherwise have to forego. So we keep our mouth shut, right? avoid him as far as, as possible, but then where expedient, we engage in a division of labor. Right? So we form a society in spite of our initial emotional reaction toward others. This is the origin of society. And Ludwig von Mises uh, has uh, generalized this finding. He says, well, I mean, the actual analysis of the uh, division of labor, which we have carried out, uh, shows that a division of labor is possible and worthwhile under all possible circumstances, in all possible cases. Because human beings are either uh, either have absolute advantages or they have comparative advantage or initially they are naturally equal. There are no other cases. These are the three only cases that exist. And in all three cases, the division of labor turns out to be beneficial, materially beneficial for all of them. 
So human beings under all circumstances have a material incentive to associate, to form society. This is the law of association. Every human being has a material incentive to associate with other human beings because he has uh, material gains, right? material advantages. Second part of the summary, we emphasize that, this, uh, that, that these beneficial effects result to the extent only that there are differences. Right? This is very important. And one political implication that follows from it is that egalitarian policies are antisocial. It's the exact opposite of what they are often presented. Right? We're making people more equal, therefore they are, uh, will be happier in society. I mean, maybe very uh, uh, de de psychologically deranged persons might be more happy to live in a society of clones, right? Well, it might, might be the case. But in any case, such a society wouldn't go very far because there are no material benefits to be derived from it. Right? Wouldn't be worthwhile to live. Uh, in such an association. There would be less incentives for peaceful and uh, civil behavior, less incentives to cooperate, less incentives. Oh, I've asked this twice, you know, so some error here. Yeah. So it follows, therefore, then, that natural differences, to the extent that they exist now, doesn't mean that we have to accept them blindly and, and worship them or something. I mean, we can work toward the elimination of natural differences. Uh, for example, there's something that occurs very naturally, right? I mentioned before the example of children and, and parents, right? Parents being the superior producer, children the inferior producer. So you let them do relatively unimportant stuff like carrying away the, the trash can and, and, and things like this. Uh, you will see when once you are parents that you have various ways to exploit the labor of your children. <laughs> Scratch my back and bring me a cup of tea or whatever. And... Uh, uh, these differences, of course, vanish in the course of time as the children grow up. And it's also, of course, a very desirable uh, outcome so that the, the absolute advantages that exist first turn into comparative adv advantages. So, but the point is, right, uh, from uh, the point of view, from the perspective of economic analysis, natural differences are certainly not a bad thing. They are actually a very useful starting point for the formation and development of human society. Because once they are there, you don't have to discuss who does what. Take again, consider the uh, case uh, of our clones, Peter and Paul exactly equal. Now, who is doing what? Who should be the hunter or who should be the gatherer? I mean, there might be a huge discussion already around this, and then two weeks of conflict and whatever, mayhem <laughs> between them until they figure it out who does what. Once there are natural differences, this is settled much more quickly. Right? So we have natural differences between men and women, parents and children, rich and poor, personal talents, geographical position, etc., etc. All natural differences. So this makes for good relationships within the household. Okay, now let's turn to uh, the way savings increase the benefits of the division of labor. And again, let's start with a few definitions. The savings are that part of a person's uh, real or monetary income, which he or she, she does not presently consume. In our lecture, again, we're not considering the particular conditions given in the monetary economy. We are considering right, uh, only the, the real layer of reality. So we're talking here about real income. Right? So there's a part of real income which is not presently consumed. These are our savings. And in fiscal terms, savings can be made in the context of a person's household or of his firm. This is important. Now the distinction that we make today in economic analysis, that is not in Austrian economics, but in, in mainstream uh, economics, Always uh, distinguish households on the one hand and firms on the other hand. Uh, this distinction plays no role in Austrian economics because we are uh, uh, concerned about human action, uh, human action in general. The distinction between a firm and a household is a fiscal di uh, distinction. It comes from the fact that the, the government taxes the population and that at some point we say, well, look, I mean, if we, we just tax random, we will just destroy our wealth. 
So why don't you text just that part uh, that is derived from the stock that we have accumulated of, uh, of wealth, of, of the additional income, and don't tax wealth? So we made the distinction, or historically the distinction appeared between a household and its firm. Right? The, the word firm comes from the Italian word firma, which is the name. Right? It's the name that we give to a subset of all of our activities, namely that subset that is uh, supposed to gain us a revenue. There are other activities that don't have this objective, which we call then our household. Okay? That's it. And if you look at your life, think a little bit about this. Right? For those of you who work in a company or who own a company, that's really what it is. I mean, it's not a distinction that we find in, in nature, that we find in observation, but that we make right, intellectually, saying this counts as an activity belonging to the firm, and this counts as an activity belonging to the household. But it's all part of the same person. Right? And uh, the same person earns uh, income in the context of his firm activities, and this income, so it's, 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 it's the journal, all right? So the, the gross revenue that we uh, obtain through the sale of our product, right? this gross revenue can be reinvested, and typically the major part of it is reinvested, and that part that is reinvested are, in fact, the gross savings right? constituted by the company. And another part are then paid out to the household in the form of uh, labor, uh, payment for labor services, so wages and so on, right? And of that part, again, a large, major chunk is consumed, but another chunk is not consumed, is saved. And so the, the total revenue that we gain through our activities right, is always subdivided in um, consumption and saving. And actually, the greater part of, uh, of total revenue gained within society is uh, used for savings. Right? The total revenue within the US uh, uh, 2008 was roughly, roughly speaking, uh, 30 trillion dollars. Okay, 30, 30 trillion dollars. And out of these uh, 30 tri uh, trillion dollars, uh, some 22, 24 trillion dollars were invested. That is, were saved and reinvested again. And only a smaller part, about 10 trillion dollars, were actually consumed. Okay. Now our interest is to understand the impact of saving on production, that is, on saving, and then, of course, the impact that savings have on the division of labor and thereby on production. The first thing that we need to keep here in mind is the law of roundabout production. Uh, so we have to distinguish between natural and human forces that are involved in any production process. That's what, what we saw at the beginning. Right? And uh, in order to pro uh, produce tools, uh, machines, uh, roads, cars, and so on, we need time. We need time to build those things. We need also time to transform uh, original factors of production, that is natural resources, into final products. Uh, so we need time to build what we call fixed capital sometimes, right? so tools, all, this, all the tool stuff, cars, and so on. And we need time to transform original materials, resources, raw materials into final products. Now, the crucial thing is the following. This is the law of roundabout production. The longer the production process, the more productive is human labor per hour worked. Why is this? Because the longer the production process, the more natural forces, that is raw materials, forces of nature, electricity, and so on, we can integrate into the production process and substitute these things for human labor. Right. The case is particularly clear in the, when we think of tools. Right? If we have to uh, carry loads uh, without cars, uh, just with uh, horses and so on, well, it's actually a, a pain in the neck or in the back of the, of, of the, of the poor horse and so on, right? Uh, so it's not as fast, not as efficient as uh, we do it with, with a car. But in order to have a car, we need to engage into time-consuming activities to bring about the car in the first place. So the more time we have, right, the more natural tools, the more natural forces we can convert into tools, right, and that then become 
more productive per hour worked. So the longer the production process, the more productive is human labor. That's the law of roundabout production. Now, a longer production process requires savings. Savings are needed to finance production. What needs to be financed in particular is the consumption of the laborers engaged in the production process. Human beings are operating under the constraint of the stomach. We need to eat right? while we are engaged in production. And this, consumer pro uh, products do not enter the picture only at the end of the production process. They enter it at the very beginning. We need to have eaten, otherwise we don't get very far with our production. So where does this foodstuff come from? Well, from previous production that we have set aside, right, that we have saved, and now are able to invest into the production, into, into keeping up human beings during the time needed to produce all the intermediate products and all the tools. Okay. So we have the law of longer, uh, roundabout production. The longer the process, the more productive is human labor. But human labor needs to be sustained, needs to be fed, needs to be clothed, etc. Uh, so we need savings to sustain human labor th throughout the production process. And the crucial point then is that, uh, of course, only human beings need to be financed right? because only human beings need to... Uh, need to consume. So consumption and finance are intimately related. Without the need for human beings to consume, there would be no need to finance any production process whatsoever. Imagine for a second we were all angels. That would be fine. Yeah, but for a second. Right? So we would never have to, to consume. It would be pure spirits. Okay, then it gets absurd, right? Because what would a pure spirit do with, uh, let's say, uh, an orange juice or <laughs> or a car or something like this, right? It gets absurd. But let's say we, we, we were. Because we never need to consume. We have all the time in the world. We, we take our time. We produce more and more tools and so on. We produce all these wonderful things that we never need. <laughs> right? But we produce ever more of them. There's no need to finance this. You don't need to take any special precautions to prepare the production process. But because human beings need to consume, we need to prepare their production by savings. We need to make sure in advance that there is enough uh, consumption stuff available to carry them on through the production process. So this means that the more sa we have savings, the longer production processes are possible, and the higher is the division of labor, the productivity of labor per hour. Okay, let's uh, consider how this works with the very quick uh, numerical example. So we're considering here a, a cruiser economy, right, a static cruiser economy that is uh, an economy uh, before an increase of saving occurs. So we have here our cruiser who um, lives at the border of a river and produces fish and he nourishes himself from this fish. So he has fish as a consumer good, and he has another consumer good, uh, which is leisure. So let's say our, our producer, he uh, fishes two fish on a day. He has no tools, nothing, right? So he fishes with his two bare hands. Unfortunately, uh, quite a few fish in the river, so he, he does catch one from time to time. He needs a day to catch two of them. He needs to eat one of them to survive the day. So the, at the end of the day, if you have caught uh, two fish, his revenue, his real revenue, is two fish. And he eats one of them, so he saves one. The next day, then, he can eat this fish, so he survives day two. He doesn't need to engage in production, so his revenue is zero. He's just eating his wealth, so to say. Right? And at the end of his day, his savings are run down to, to zero, but he had had a great day. Right? He has consumed a fish. And he has consumed 10 hours of leisure. He is sitting in the grass, looked at the sky, sung with the birds, observed other animals, saw a spider eating a, a fly, catching in his net, and so on. Yeah. 
And he lives this existence happily day in, day out. Right? So just it's always the same day in, day out. He's a happy savage. Right? He has always some, some leisure. One day then, it occurs to him that, in fact, his life is, is quite miserable. Or maybe he meets a Friday or Fridina. <laughs> and Fridina is not happy at all with this hand-to-mouth existence. So she thinks there should be something more on the table than fish. And maybe we could need some decent clothing and a, and a hovel or something like this. I mean, we cannot go on like this. So think about what, 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 how can we improve our situation? And then he remembers the spider that caught the, the fly and said, yeah, I could actually try to do the same thing. I could try to catch the fish with a net, build a net myself. So he goes on thinking about this throughout his leisure days, how he will go about building a net right, with raw material that he finds in the jungle and so on. And then finally he has a plan. He has a plan. He, and the, the plan is risky, of course, because he has never made a net in his life, right? So but he puts him into execution, right? Entrepreneurship under uncertainty, right? And then does the following thing. So we have here the following scenario, saving consumption in a growing crucial economy. Now it's the following plan. He needs four days to construe the net. So what does he need to have? He needs to have then savings that will allow him to go through net production. So he now renounces to his leisure day, right? so his real consumption diminishes, and he consecrates the time now to uh, fishing in order to accumulate a greater stock of fish. So at the end of day four, he has savings of four fish. So the following four days then, he can engage in the construction of a net. Right? So that's what he does. Right, days five, six, seven, eight, right? You see his fish production is zero, but he construes a net. Until on day eight, he finally has one full net. And so I put here 0 0.25, 0 0.5, but you cannot fish with a half net, right? So it's kind of superfluous, right? Like you, you cannot be half pregnant or something, right? You cannot fish with a, with a half net. Right? So, um, so on, on day eight then, uh, this is, wait a minute, uh, leisure, this is wrong here. This, this should be zero, this should also be zero. Right? He, uh, he eats his last fish, the fish that was re uh, remaining of his savings on day, at the end of day seven, right? He eats it on day eight, but then finally he has his net. And on day, ni uh, day nine, the glorious day, when his act of uh, entrepreneurship turns out to have succeeded, right? Don't go all through, through all the cases where it just screws up and so on. But he succeeds. And he catches 13 fish. <sighs> His wife has already dug a, a ground in the hole and filled it with water so that you can keep all the fish. And she has already plans for her husband what he will do during the next 13 years, uh, 13 days. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> hunt down wild animals who had leather stuff, right, to uh, have nice furs and so on, construe a hovel, right? and from time to time he returns to fishing, again, 13 fish, and there's another 13-day project and so on, right? So this technological progress, right, greatly advances his ability to consume, but also to, um, uh, to accumulate further capital goods, right, become further productive. Okay, so we see uh, the benefits of savings, right, the, uh, we have a higher productivity of human labor. Right? Savings allow us to engage in longer production processes. That's what we have seen. They enable what Austrian economists call roundabout production. But they do also something else. Savings allow us to uh, reinforce and promote technological progress. Remember what I said to you about the origin of this idea. When did he get this idea of construing a net in my Narrative, well, on his day of leisure. While he's completely absorbed, concentrated on fishing, he doesn't have time to think about nets. It's only when he has some leisure time left that he can think about all these other things, what else he could do. And that's actually one of the main preconditions of technological progress. You pay guys to just think about new technologies. 
So all persons hired by research departments in companies, but also uh, universities, uh, public, private, and so on, they are all paid out of savings. Technological progress is premised on savings. In private companies, you have the research department that results from savings out of past revenue from the company. Uh, so set aside to pay, uh, to hire people for the research department is, but it's savings. Right? And I, of course, I'm, I'm living on forced savings because people don't like to pay taxes. Well, they hand them over to me, which is about the best use you can make with robbed uh, euros. Right? But, but it's the same thing. So we can finance R&D. R&D uh, needs to be financed out of savings. And then the second thing is savings can be, uh, R&D can be put into practice only if, with additional savings, right? Just having the idea is just the first step. Then you also need them into practice. You need to construe the machines or the tools that you have just invented. So you need more savings to pay labor during the time needed to construe these things. Right? So savings promote technological progress on two accounts. No, no, this is not a separate force. Technological pro uh, progress is virtually entirely premised on savings. There's no technological progress without savings. And finally, so and this brings us back in a great loop to our initial subject, the division of labor, savings reinforce the division of labor. Think about what happened in the case of our Crusoe. Crusoe, at the beginning, had a one-step production process, fish production. Now, thanks to the savings, he has a two-step production process as far as fishing is concerned. Maybe first net making, then fishing. And as we have seen, thanks to the, uh, greater, his greater productivity, he can now also engage in other activities, hunting, building, and so on. Right? Now, what does this mean? It means that thanks to savings, there's a greater number of activities that become possible which had not become possible before. In a Crusoe economy, Crusoe has to take care of all of these activities himself. But in a society, in a larger society, this gives rise to a greater possibility for the division of labor. Right? There's now suddenly, thanks to savings, there's an additional branch of industry that arises, this is net making. Before there were only fishers, now there's net making. Then there's hunting, right, and hovel building, and so on and so on. So the greater are our savings, the more numerous become the opportunities for a division of labor. A poor society in which there are no savings, no capital accumulation, whatever, does not have a great scope for the division of labor, right? All people scramble in the few activities, and they are relatively uh, unproductive. They cannot exploit their specific differences. The greater is the division of labor, that is, the greater is the amount of capital that we have invested, the more easy it becomes for each individual to bring into play his or her own specific comparative advantages. Okay. So, consequence also, peace and cooperation are reinforced. Uh, and I'll leave this aside. Okay, in conclusion. A few remarks on the problem of coordination, right? So the problem of uh, coordination uh, requires first a definition. We speak of uh, coordination when the persons that are engaged in the division of labor uh, find that the results are satisfactory for each of them. And we say that they are coordinated, and of course this is a, a gradual uh, concept. And it brings into play again the distinction that we uh, made before between the production or productivity and the value of the, the production, right? Think of the paper planes again. It's not because we produce more planes that we are happy with the outcome, right? We need to value the product. So if we produce our paper planes, we're not happy with the outcome, we're not coordinated. Right? But if each of us finds his, his account, we are coordinated. The problem of coordination then is to put a concrete division of labor into practice. This involves most notably two decisions. The first one is to decide who does what. Who does what? Right? Peter and Paul need to divide labor amongst them. But who does what? Uh, this might also involve the decision who decides who does what. Right? That's a political decision. And the second uh, great question is uh, relative to the distribution of the overall result. Who obtains how much out of the aggregate product? There are, by and large, only three peaceful solutions to the coordination problem. 
I'll leave aside, uh, aside uh, the violent solutions, which are, by the way, not real solutions at all. The first one is collective decision making on the model of the producer cooperative. Right? So all producers gather together, they make a, a common plan, divide labor amongst them, and make a plan for the distribution of the product. So we have coordination through the central planning uh, of productive activities and the central planning of the distribution of revenues. And then everybody submits voluntarily to the execution of this plan. Okay. How important is this in practice? Well, we just need to look at divorce rates to get a rough measure of the success of this model, right? I mean, uh, uh, as we always say, where there are two, there's at least one traitor. <laughs> <laughs> right? So if it's, possible, if it's difficult to, right, to, to find a plan for two, and how can we imagine that we can organize 10 or 100 or 1,000 or, uh, or 300 million, as in the United States, in a, in a common plan, right? So it's completely ludicrous. This will never work. Not in a voluntary setting, okay? Second one is representative decision making, for example, through an elected government or a board, or for example, through a guru, the guru model. The, the one uh, guru that I picked here is uh, Reverend Moon, who some of you might have heard of. Reverend Moon, I'll spare you the details of his very peculiar uh, theology, but it has to, something to do with marriage. So Jesus didn't finish the job, he did it because he didn't get married. The Reverend Moon has volunteered, he got married, and he's now promoting marriage as a means for the sanctification of the world. And what he does then is to assemble his followers from all over the world once a year in a big stadium, and they get married. So it's a guy from Germany he gets married with a girl from Japan, and a girl from France gets married with an Eskimo, and so on and so on. <laughs> this is a picture of one of these, these meetings. Right? So, this, this is the, the best case that I'm uh, able to make out of this, I, I, because right, subjecting yourself, voluntarily submitting to a central plan involving all of your life and so on, you need to believe in this guru. Okay? And the Reverend Moon, actually, he has uh, quite a few followers. I think it's about a million or two. They pro probably do almost everything that he asks of them. Okay? But that's how far as it gets. Right? <laughs> You cannot organize, you cannot even organize Switzerland on the basis of this model, right? And certainly not Germany or France or, or the world economy. It's impossible, right? So the only thing that works then is the market economy. It's the only model that actually works for a large number of associates. So in the market economy, we have uh, private property of the means of production, there is no central plan, there is decentralized planning, which is based on economic calculation and entrepreneurial vision, which is subjective to each entrepreneur, have different opinions about the future, take different actions to prepare for the future. And uh, the con uh, coordination here is not centrally planned, but spontaneous. That is, it results from the mutual adjustment of individual behavior through competitive contracting. I pay you more than the other guy pays you, therefore you work for me, you cooperate with me. Why am I able to pay you more? Well, because I expect that we together produce a product that is more valued by our customers, that they are ready to pay more for, than uh, for the products of our competitors. Okay? And the revenues do not result in this uh, case from uh, central planning either, so there's no distribution of revenue. Uh, but the revenues result from the contracts themselves, the side effect of the contract. Okay? That was it. Thank you.